every film is different, um, but the sort of common thread, I, I usually, this is my seventh film with Chris Nolan, so we have a established process that doesn't, other directors I work with, we don't, we don't do the same thing. But um, with him, he's usually in his writing phase, in his house, and traditionally I've always gone in in that phase, and we sort of had uh, his, his old double garage is in the art room. And so I try and give him visuals, visual ideas or cues for the film. Yeah, again, every film's different. So on Dunkirk, it was really going in to sort of study it uh, because it, because it was uh, such a well-known event. We realized within you know, a week of sitting down at his house that it was, he'd already written the script, it was the shortest script he's ever written. Um, and so we kind of sat there, we looked around, it's like, we've got to get on a plane, go to Dunkirk. So I actually met him in Dunkirk uh, very early on, and we decided we'd just walk the whole beach. So we walked 18 miles. We kind of realized we couldn't fake any of it. We had to actually go and shoot in Dunkirk, and we had to do as much of it practically as we could, even though Dunkirk's a really, it's a difficult beach to film on because it, it's a difficult beach to get off because uh, it's got a 21 foot tide. Uh, it, it's very particular to the event. And so we immediately knew, even though it was gonna be very hard to make the film there, we had to go and make it there. So that's kind of how it started. Then we went back to his house and we spent a couple of months just um, trying to figure out how to achieve everything, how to, how to do it with as little VFX as possible. You know, how do we do the flying stuff? How do we do the boats? And so we sort of came to the sort of further realization we had to build an armada of big ships and little ships. So then uh, I actually took off and went kind of you know, around most of Europe looking for ships, uh, and, you know, looking for the hospital ship, which is, uh, came, out of, uh, came out of Norway, the Rogaland. I was looking for destroyers, working destroyers. Um, minesweepers, so we had to build this armada. So we, it was a sort of very, it was a very difficult film to try and make practically. So we had to sort of one find planes, two decide to how we were going to do all the ships, whether we were going to scale them down, whether we we're going to use half scale ships. Now, half scale destroyer is is you know 180 foot long, so you could you can use a boat that's much smaller, and then you have to build. The scenery on the decks and make it seaworthy to make a full-size destroyer at over 150 feet. So we sort of came up with all these sort of practical ways of achieving the film. I mean, we were not doing anything new. They've been doing it pre-visual effects for donkey's years. So we, we, uh, we, but we, you know, how do we put an IMAX camera on a World War II plane and fly it in formation and capture that on film? Um, so we, there was a lot of practical, enormous amount of practicalities. Um, and that kind of, to begin with, overrode the design theme. And then, you know, as we got further into it and we looked at other research, we realized that Dunkirk, you know, everyone sees it as this sort of little, you know, three-story seaside town, but actually it was a big industrial port. So we really want to play with the, the, the industry and the bleakness of, of the other side of Dunkirk, um, which kind of played into our film, the sort of, this lonely place, inescapable place. There were very few photographs taken of the event. So finding uh, enough research was, was difficult. But weirdly, uh, the Dunkirk Library, uh, when we finally got into it, had an enormous amount of photographic research of the event. Uh, um, so really, that's where we spent. I mean, the, the seat of Dunkirk were phenomenal. So they opened their doors to us. And that's where their archives uh, were amazing. Most of the troops escaped on the East Mole, which was this kilometer long, seven and a half feet wide pier, white pier that went out to sea. Um, <coughs> so and it wasn't there when it had been demolished over the years. So, you know, for us, that was a very key image, this sort of singular uh, tonal white pier, the road to nowhere. So that was, you know, that these soldiers were lined up on uh, and that was really a key image, but you know, like the big problem with that is we had to rebuild that pier into the English Channel. So that was another. It was a big physical task to, and we rebuilt um, about six, seven hundred feet of it into the sea, 
with a 21 foot tie. So it became this giant logistical issue to achieve a very sort of simple image. Uh, and that would go, you know, we had the white pier, the hospital ship, we had these in, in these sort of gray seas. So it was very, very controlled, um, a very controlled palette when you look at the film. And then we go to the air. Uh, so there were, you know, we were running with all these elements, uh, but the underlying issue as a designer was trying to achieve them in these harsh conditions. I mean, the, we had, um, like our British Army, <laughs> we had 3,000 men that we painted and cut out and stuck on the beach. So all the background armies are literally old school cutouts of soldiers pegged out on the beach and they spent like two months on the beach. A lot of the airplanes are miniatures, they're flying miniatures. So the, the plane that you see uh, Collins in, is a, uh, it's got a Spitfire cockpit, it was a two-seater yak that we built a Spitfire cockpit in so the IMAX camera could film it in formation with the other two planes, so all that is live. So it's all very, you know, it meant a lot to me to try and achieve everything practically. Uh, but it's not the easiest thing to do. <laughs> Pre-production became about logistics. It's like um, we'd be talking to these museum, these museum ships that were sort of barely running, and we'd be asking if they'd be willing to sail, you know, <laughs> 500 miles south to Dunkirk and be in a film. So, you know, again, you're you're out there with real people, with real boat owners, trying to persuade them to steam down to Dunkirk and be in a film and paint their boat. boat. Or, uh, you know, we'd be in Holland and we'd be trying to get the minesweepers to allow us to shrink their turrets, essentially, and put guns, fake guns, and, you know, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of legwork and a lot of, um, in pre-production, there was a lot, a lot of legwork on, or how do we build the, the East Mower? How do we, on a 21-foot tide, how do we, how do we even start to build it? We've got a four-hour window to put the steel plates in, and then we have to build it up. And by the end of the day, we have to get onto the decking of that section. And then the next day, we have to do it all again. And so until we sort of slowly step out to see. So it was by far the most logistically challenging film. A lot of people probably would give up uh, because those battles we have to try and get this, even the mole built in heavy weather or persuade Dutch ships to come over and we, they're historic ships and we have to change them. You know, a lot of people would immediately go to the digital aspect, we, but we knew we'd sort of ruin the film if we did that. So, um, you know, it was a lot of legwork and holding fast, as I <laughs> would say. And it, honestly, it took every film we'd done before to be able to achieve this, because we knew we could do it. It was about keeping people with us to help us. Uh, you know, the French authorities, the, the mayor had to help, the, the the, the city had to agree to let us rebuild the mole. We had to keep our armada on the, in the inland docks. Um, you know, we, we, and that was before we even got to the small ships and landed a real spitfire on the beach. So, um, you know, so it was, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of that film. Um, but when I watch it, it was, I remember every day. <laughs> and so, so that was pre-production. Then we started filming. And then it's it, then you're on the it's a big freight train coming down the line, and we have to. I always open the set, and then I have to move on to figure out the, the next day's work. So Chris will always say to me, "What are you still doing here? You know, you need to get on to tomorrow." And um, uh, and so we always work ahead, but you know, as usual, we're working in more than one country, so it's a lot of traveling involved. So you're running three art departments, and you've got to keep everyone moving.